Merry Christmas, church. I'm glad that you're here. If you have uh, your Bible, we're going to meet together in John chapter 1, where we have been together. You can find it on your phone if you'd like, but we are going to be there in John chapter 1. We're reaching, I think, the, the peak of this mountaintop of verses 1 through 18 in John chapter 1. I'll begin reading in verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. And Father, we pray that you would do that again, that you would make him known, perhaps maybe for the first time to someone here, a friend here, and to those of us who know you would, would see you afresh and love you deeper. In Jesus' name, amen. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and it was good. And on the sixth day, God created man and woman in his own image to be like him and to be with him. And it was very good. Every piece of creation was in its proper place doing what it was designed to do. From the the smallest particle of dust to the temperature of the seasons. From the atmospheric pressure of the globe to the level of the seas, every piece of God's creation was in its proper place, doing as it was designed to do. From the relationship between human beings to the relationship between human beings and their God, between creator and creation, the relationship was perfect. Everything was doing what it was designed to do and was in its proper place. In a word, everything was perfectly balanced. And in one act of rebellion, of sin against the Creator, everything was thrown off balance. The perfectly balanced chemicals of the brain and, and thought patterns and emotions of human beings was suddenly thrown off balance, and suddenly weight was given to shame. <clears throat> where work, which was in the design and goodness of God and was enjoyed by man and woman, this, this part of his perfectly balanced creation, where work was once enjoyed, suddenly thorns grew up out of the garden. And where once man walked harmoniously with their God, suddenly they ran and hid unstable in all of their ways. 
you and I were born into this great imbalance. You were born crooked and bent, and so was I. And we know this great imbalance. We know it well in our own hearts and in our own lives, and we know the great imbalance of this world and life in which we live. We all know what it feels like, don't we, to lose our balance. Uh, You probably, most of the time, don't think about losing your balance. It's just not something you necessarily have to think a whole lot about. But you sure know when you've lost your balance, don't you? Um, Probably, I'm guessing, most of us learned how to ride a bike at one point. And until that point, uh, you had training wheels on, and what those training wheels were helping you realize was where everything was supposed to be doing exactly what it was supposed to be doing. Feet on the pedals, hands on the handlebars, tires straight up and down, equally dispensing your weight. These training wheels are trying to teach you where everything is supposed to be doing exactly what it was supposed to be doing. And then mom and dad took those training wheels off. And you began to ride, and you instantly began losing your balance until you kept trying and kept trying to find your balance. We understand what it is to lose our balance, and we understand what it means to live in a dark and an unbalanced world. Our bodies are made up of trillions, I've read, of working parts. All parts that are constantly changing and building and tearing down and regenerating and adjusting. And yet, all of the parts of the human body need to operate in balance. Otherwise, we malfunction. Um, Autoimmune diseases are a clear sign and description of just how imbalanced our bodies can be, where our immune system, which was designed by God to protect our body, suddenly turns on our body and begins to eat and devour the good, healthy tissues of our body. We're imbalanced. Um, We get sick. We're living one day, and then we die the next We're happy one day, and the next day we're completely depressed. We are unbalanced. We work more than we rest with our family, or we lay around more than we work. We eat way too much, or we eat way too little. We sleep too much, or we can hardly go to sleep. More weight is given to our phones than to our spouses. We care more about our kids' academics than we do their spiritual life and character. Women are objectified and abused rather than cherished and loved. Marriages just grow disproportionate to one another and rarely do they last inside and outside of the church. We say yes to things our schedule has no room to have. We hoard our money instead of giving more and more to the poor. Families sleep in climate-controlled homes while sometimes single moms and their babies sleep in a car. Tornadoes rip through towns. Hurricanes, as you and I well know, come through and destroy sections of the earth and flood our Homes, government grows increasingly unbalanced. Pastors, rather than feeding their sheep, devour their sheep. One race of people despises another race of people. People kill one another. People take their own lives. Countries invade other countries, and wars break out because we live in a world that has been completely thrown off balance from the way in which God designed it to be. I've seen a device. It's really quite amazing to see that's built for a boat. It's called a sea keeper. If you've ever seen one of these, it's quite amazing to see because what a sea keeper is is a large flywheel that's inside of a housing down within that boat. 
And when that flywheel is engaged, what that thing begins to do is spin rapidly inside of that housing at thousands of RPMs, I read. So that when you are in the turbulent waves of the ocean, or maybe you got two or three really big guys on each side of the boat just pulling and rocking that boat, when the captain of that boat engages the sea keeper, what happens to that boat is that flywheel begins to spin rapidly and it counteracts and balances that boat perfectly. It is unreal to see. You could begin to pull and push with as many big guys as you want on the side of that boat. And when that sea keeper is engaged and spinning and counteracting what is going on around that boat, it remains still and solid. In John chapter 1, verses 14 to 18, is the sea keeper of the world. It is the sea keeper of the world, and it brings balance to a dark and shaky and chaotic and evil world. And it can bring balance. It can bring so much more than just balance <laughs> to your dark and your unstable heart and life. Even the structure of these words that were given to us, as only the Holy Spirit could do, even the structure of these words is given to us and packaged to us in such a balanced way. It's amazing to see because the way in which these sentences are packaged to us are in what's called a chiasmus. They're in a chiastic form. So just hold on, a little, little grammar, a little, little nerdy stuff. Can you do that with me? Okay, it's a chiasmus. Now, just to put it simply, a chiasmus is a sentence or phrase. Sometimes it's larger pieces of literature where there's two parts to the phrase. And the second part of the phrase is directly like the first, just simply inverted to really drive emphasis and to bring balance to that sentence. I'll give you just a few examples. And you'll get this right away. I asked if they'd put them on the screen so we could look at them together. Uh, you know the popular saying, uh, if it comes up here, the first one, first slide. Here it is. You know this. When the going gets tough, the tough get going, right? It's in this A, B, B, A form. Benjamin Franklin said this next one when he said, by failing to prepare, you are preparing to fail. Failing, prepare, preparing, fail. Do you see that? John F. Kennedy said the next one. Look what he said. Let us never negotiate out of fear, but let us never fear to negotiate. You tracking with me? You see how the first part of the phrase is inverted to the second part of the phrase, bringing balance and driving emphasis to what is being said. You can take that one down. Um, it's quite amazing that the first 18 verses of John chapter 1, all 18 verses are in this form. I would encourage you to study and try to figure out how does it do it. And I'll give you a hint. It leads all the way up to verse 12 and then inverts and drives emphasis and says the same thing backwards. But even right here in just these few verses of verses 14 to 18 is a chiasmus. It's chiastic. And I want you to see this. So hold on just one minute because some of those chiasmus have a middle point. Um, a middle point that is sort of dividing and showing the two sides that are balancing and inverted of one another. That middle point is verse 15. Mine's in parentheses when it says that John bore witness about him and cried out, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. John is speaking clearly about Jesus, that Jesus ranks before him because he was before him. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. That is Jesus. You know what's amazing? Quick little parenthesis here. 
John was just bearing witness to the light. He was bearing witness to Jesus. And here it is in this middle point of this chiastic form of these few verses. And John the Baptist in this moment in 2023 is still bearing witness to the light of Jesus Christ. That should be a life you want to live. That when you're dead and gone, they talk about you in a way of, he just pointed to Jesus. She just, she still does. But that's the middle point. Let's see what surrounds that. Let's put that next slide up so you can see this. And the word became flesh, in verse 14, and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Right? There's your first little section. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace, for the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. Do you, are you with me? Do you see it? How the first is the same as the ending. The middle two are corresponding. Now, they're not always the same in these chiasmus uh, structures. But John, is, the Holy Spirit, has packaged this to us in such a balanced way. Do You see, it's inverted and balances and drives emphasis as to what is being said. So, thank you. You can take that down. So, I tried thinking, how could we put that in a phrase, those few verses, to help us feel this, to understand this. And I just think that the old missionary and evangelist, uh, E. Stanley Jones, said it perfectly. When he said, when he was writing about the early Christians, what he said is, the early Christians would not have said things like, look what this world has come to. But they would say, look what has come into the world. They wouldn't bemoan the evil and darkness of this world that surrounded them and say, look what this world has come to. They would say with joy, oh, look what has come into the world. When the going gets tough, the tough get going. What's that all about? That's, that's all about hard times and those who press on through it and those people are characterized as strong and brave and tough. And Jones said that the early Christians didn't say, look what has come, what the world has come to, but they said, look what has come into the world. What's that all about? That's Christmas. That's Christmas. That's John chapter 1. It's all about the reality of God himself coming into the rough seas of our life, coming into our unbalanced, sin-ridden life, living with us as fully human and having a fully human experience while being fully God. He was all human, and he was all God. And he came to reveal himself to us as the great ballast and sea keeper of the world. Those early Christians didn't bemoan what the world had come to. They said in amazement, look what has come into the world. So let's just do that. Let's just look at who has come into the world because that is what John is doing in these few verses of 14 to 18. He's showing us exactly who God is. So what is God like is the question. What is he like? He was seen. He was touched. He cried as a baby. He nursed at his mother's breast. Men shook his hand. Women had conversations with him. He hung out with people. Day, days on end, people would be with him. He ate meals with people. And we have his words, amazingly, preserved for us in a book that has been preserved for us, that has still sold more copies than any other book in the world. So what's he like? 
What is this God like who took on flesh and was born in Bethlehem? In a word, maybe you're sick of me saying, he was perfectly balanced. Perfectly. Though you and I are off balance and we put more weight onto the things of this life and on this world, God has never lost his balance. He's never lost control. He isn't shaky. He isn't teetering. When he came to us and lived as a fully human and fully God, he never caved into the temptation we so quickly cave to. He's perfectly balanced. In verse 14, John says, We've seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. The glory of God was on full display in the person of Jesus Christ. What's the glory of God? The glory of God is all of his attributes, everything about who God is put together and put on to display. That's the glory of God and all of its radiance. It might kind of sound, I don't know, I don't want it to sound trite or, or crass or anything, but for some reason, if you have little kids, especially little boys for some reason, they love to be naked. I don't know what it is about it, but they do. Maybe after bath time or something, they love just getting out of that bath and running around naked, right? And maybe in that moment, we would say to each other as adults, there he is in all of his glory. glory. This is Christmas. This is when the word became flesh, and if I may, revealed his naked self to us. In all of his glory. And in all of his glory, we discover who God is in Jesus Christ. Christmas is amazing because all that you could possibly ever come to know about Jesus Christ, all about God, is found in a baby born in a barn. And he's perfectly balanced full of grace and truth. John says the contents of the glory of God, the, 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 uh, the, what makes God up is grace and truth. You and I typically favor one over the other. Some of us are all grace, so kind, so gentle, so compassionate, loving all the Time, no matter what, affectionate, but maybe not as true and faithful. Some of us are all truth. Letter of the law, black and white, facts are facts, legalistic, ungentle, unkind, maybe not even willing to be seen with those blatantly, offensively sin- sinful people. We're unbalanced. And our God is full of grace and truth. He is not more grace than he is truth. And he is not more truth than he is grace. He is full of grace and truth. His grace is true. His grace towards you, friend, is not hypothetical. It's not just a good idea that Christians have. His grace is true. And his truth is true. Gracious. Grace because he's come to us all, making a way through the cross and resurrection, making a way for all of us who have sinned and fall short of the glory of God to come to God the Father and have relationship with him. That's grace. It's truth because no one comes to God the Father except through Jesus Christ. It's truth. Because all have fallen short. No one seeks after God. No one does good. No one is righteous. And every single one of us is a sinner. And it's grace because Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. 
The truth of Christ is objective. It's factual. It abides to the law of God. But his truth, listen to this, his truth also reveals to us reality. His truth shows us the way things are and why they are the way things are and why you are the way that you are. We've talked about this through these verses, that he is light. His truth is light. When you flick on the lights, it reveals reality around you that you couldn't see in the darkness. And it reveals to you why you are the way you are and why this world is so shaky and unstable and unbalanced. And his grace raises us up with a confident hope despite the way things really are. His grace is kind and lowly. It's, it's accessible. It's tender and compassionate. His grace is on the house. No strings attached. A world without truth without absolute truth, not the truth that you say you have yours and I'll have mine, but a world without truth, absolute truth is delusional. And a world without grace, listen, is absolutely hopeless. And the only God, verse 18, who's at the Father's side, he's made him known and he is full of grace and truth. He's explained to us, he's revealed to us God himself. And then in verse 18, he says those words, who's at the Father's side, the only God who's at the Father's side. Now, some other translations, maybe yours reads, the only God who is in the Father's bosom. That's a better translation. It's showing us the intimacy and closeness of God the Father and the Son and the Spirit of The only God who's in the the Father's chest. And if you keep digging in that Greek word, what you'll find underneath it is that, and I think is, is better, is what you'll see is it really means lap. Lap. The only God who's in the Father's lap. He's made him known to us. And I think the lap is a really good place for us to feel the full weight of who God is. Full of grace and truth, the goodness and loving kindness of our God and how he explains reality as it really is and gives us a hope despite the way things really are. Melissa, my wife and I, we have four kids. Our youngest is seven months old right now. Uh, are my three big kids. I love it. They can come and jump on my lap and sit down and lay across me as much as they want. I love it. I love how they just confidently and comfortably will just sprawl out across my lap. But my seven-month-old can't yet do that. She can't do that on her own. Her name's Claire. I want you to just see her. So watch this quick video. I want you to see Claire. Melissa sent me this this week. Look at her. What are you doing? Thank you, Bill. <laughs> That's good. Thank you. Isn't she the best? She's just the best. And she's only seven months old. And listen, she can't yet keep her balance. We put her on the ground to play, and we put pillows all around her when she's playing because so often she'll just move her body in just a little way, and she just topples over. And when she does, I get down on her level, and I pick her up. I bring her, and I put her on my lap. Make her stable. There's nothing in the world that could harm her in that moment. And I think... She experiences grace and truth when I pick her up and put her on my lap. Grace because she just draws every good thing about me out. (laughs) 
and I hold her and kiss her and comb her hair back and whisper in her ear, put her in my chest, snuggle her. I'm gentle with her. I care for her. And listen, she doesn't have to do a thing to earn that love from me. It's on the house. (laughs) No strings attached. But she also experiences truth as she sits on my lap. You know how I think she does? Because she takes those soft little hands of hers and she starts rubbing them all over my face. If I have my reading glasses on, she tries grabbing those reading glasses. She grabs my nose. She pulls my hair. She sticks her hands in my mouth. And you know what I think she's doing in those times? She's discovering reality. She's she's finding out who we are and what a nose is and what a mouth is. She's finding out truth about who I am and who she is. And she's discovering as she's in the world, if I bring her outside, she just grabs grass and she tries to eat it. She don't know that's not food. She's discovering truth and reality. When we realize who God is, in his glory revealed to us in Jesus Christ, and you receive his fullness of grace upon grace upon grace, you will find equilibrium in this unbalanced and evil world. That doesn't mean your world is going to suddenly be perfect. It won't. I promise you. Jesus promises you that. But what I can tell you is that everything, though it doesn't stop shaking and crashing around you in your life, everything will be so imbalanced and unstable and twisted. But within your heart of hearts, you will be on the solid ground of grace and truth. Because when you receive him for who he truly is, you know what he says in verse 12? When you receive him and believe in him, you become his kid. And he picks you up and puts you on his lap and brings you in close. And you will begin to experience one wave of grace after another wave of his loving kindness. And you will see the world as it really is and have a living and abiding hope that goes beyond all the chaos of this world in your life. And you might even begin to not say so much, look what this world has come to. But you will say, look what has come into this world. They say if you're dizzy or off balance, you've lost your balance, you're dizzy. What they say is you better fix your eyes on one fixed position, one unmovable, sure point of reference so that you can regain your composure and your unbalance. And friends, my prayer for you this Christmas has been that you would fix your eyes on the, un- the, the steady, rock-solid person of Jesus Christ, the baby born in Bethlehem. He is unmoving. He is unbalanced. And listen, when you fix your eyes, when you turn your eyes upon Jesus, as the song says, and you look full in his wonderful face, the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Merry Christmas. Father, we praise you. We praise you for your son. And we ask, Lord, for your help that we would fix our eyes upon Jesus, full of grace and truth, and enjoy him forever. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We have three candlelight services tonight. I hope you and your family will make one. Four o'clock, 5.30, and seven. We'll see you there, okay?